Hello and happy Pride, happy June, um, happy Tuesday. Uh, it's uh, wonderful to be with you all again today for another episode of Human Centered Leading. Uh, I'm Brian McComick, the founder and CEO of Hummingbird Humanity, and I am really excited about today's conversation. Um, you know, I, I, as all of you who've been with us before probably get the sense that I really enjoy these live events, and you're right, I do. Um, and certainly that's partly because I you know, want to be a celebrity someday. Um, but the, really the reason I love them is because they're just really fantastic conversations, and I always learn. Um, so I hope that you feel the same way when you join um, and, um, and always take away something from these conversations. And thank you for being with us. Your time is valuable. Um, and I think today is one of those conversations that you're not going to, you're, you won't want to miss. That's what, that's the phrase I was looking for. So can we bring up the slide so I can just do a bit of the, um, uh, the overview of, uh, some of the, the updates for hummingbird humanity. So again, we're here for human centered leading. Um, this is a conversation where leaders are human, where we really just invite our guests who are experts in their fields, uh, to just really bring their humanity and their expertise to the conversation so we can all learn from them, um, and their lived experiences and their professional experiences. So I'm excited for today's conversation and I'll introduce our speakers in a moment. If you aren't already following us, please follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Um, those we have Hummingbird Humanity channels on all three of those, and then um, I'm also on um, Instagram and LinkedIn. Um, so, so follow us there. We share content and updates. And um, one of my favorite um, series is called Bosco's Biscuit, where my wonderful, beautiful dog, who's our chief, chief happiness officer, shares tips on um, being inclusive and, and how diversity conversations are for kids too. So definitely check out Bosco's Biscuit. Um, as a reminder, every month there are cultural holidays and events and heritage days um, that are important to the employees in your organizations. Um, so each month we try to provide the, um, the list of the upcoming events and days. So here's the, 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 the latest one for you. Um, and um, we also share this on our social media. So you can also follow our social media channels to get these updates every month. And um, I'm excited to, to remind everyone that we have our final in our four-part series of our DEI uh, Foundation Workshop. Actually, it's not a four parts. It's four different sessions of the DEI Foundations Workshop. This is our one of our signature programs. It's the first program we developed at Hummingbird, and then all of the employees that our clients go through this workshop. Uh, it's a great way to, to start the journey of your of understanding the, just the basics and, uh, and foundational things that are part of how we bring diversity, equity, and inclusion to workplaces. And I think it looks like April attended our uh, DEI Foundations workshop, and uh, she says, I highly recommend this workshop to anyone who seeks to deepen their understanding of DEI and contribute to positive change inside and outside of the workplace. Thanks so much, April. And if you're interested, um, we're going to be sharing the link in the chat and wherever you're watching on LinkedIn or Facebook. So check it out there and um, please join us for our next DEI Foundations virtual workshop. I'm also really proud to share that we were invited to partner with Robert Walters uh, on their uh, report on LGBTQ plus um, hiring practices and um, salary negotiations and conversations. And so that report was released uh, just earlier this month. Um, and you can visit the Hummingbird Humanity website and look for the LGBTQ plus microsite, which we'll put the um, link in the chat as well. And so on that site, you can find this report, which has which is full of lots of information and insights that'll help you as in your organization become more inclusive for the LGBTQ plus community. And the microsite adds to the, the content and the report itself. So if you're looking for additional tips and tools and research and understanding, all of that's there for you um, in a user-friendly microsite. So check it out. And without further ado, I'm delighted to invite and welcome our two guests. First is Andrea Forst, who is the Chief Consulting Officer at Hummingbird Humanity. So I get to work with Andrea every day. Uh, Andrea, welcome. I'm, I'm delighted to, to share this um, space with you. I think it's our first time doing one of these live events together, isn't it? I think it is, Brian. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Absolutely. So thank you for being here. And then Bobby Wilkinson, who I um, have known for a few years. We met at Out and Equal um, and... Uh, have just stayed in touch over the years. And I'm so glad that you said yes, Bobby. We're, we're really proud, proud to have you today. Thank you. And I am also very glad to be here. Excited. Excellent. Well, let's dive in. We've Everyone's heard enough from me already. So let's let's hear from you. Um, you know, one of the um, 
for everyone out there, you know, if you haven't heard this before, at Hummingbird, one of our goals is to bring humanity to the workplace. So when we do our introductions, we share both about what we do, which we're all familiar with, but also a little bit about who we are. So I'm going to invite Andrea to, to do a Hummingbird intro and kick us off. Awesome. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Andrea Forscht. Um, I am the Chief Consulting Officer at Hummingbird Humanity. Says Brian said we get to work together very closely on a, on a regular basis. I've been with Hummingbird for um, about eight and a half months now. Um, so kind of getting closer to that year mark um, this fall, which is really exciting. Um, I have a rich background in working on HR leadership teams, helping to lead the employee experience kind of vertical um, COE for, for those organizations. So everything like social impact, diversity, equity and inclusion, uh, running surveys, anything related to, to really kind of people and culture um, really kind of fell underneath kind of my, my remit in those organizations. And so um, I bring kind of my um, strong uh, sense of relationship building, um, my leading with vulnerability, authenticity, um, empathy um, to help to, to build connections and relationships to really help people kind of understand how better to relate to each other um, so that we can have better outcomes for organizations. And so now I get to do that um, across multiple uh, organizations with Hummingbird. Um, so personally, I sit just outside of the Twin Cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul in a town called Savage, Minnesota. Um, uh, we are, I, I identify as a biracial woman. So that'll be part of the story that I'll share with you when we, we hit the loving day conversation a little bit later. My mother is an immigrant from the Philippines. My father is a black man from South Minneapolis. Um, I'm also a mother of three little ones um, and have been happily married to, to my husband for about 13 years. So that's a little bit about me and I'll toss it over to Bobby to, to do your intro. Thank you, Andrea. And thank you again, Brian, for the invite. Uh, Bobby Wilkinson, my pronouns are he, him. Uh, my intersectionalities where I identify, I am a person of faith that I am very proud of that. Uh, I live with a disability. I am a gay man. Uh, I am black. I am a descendant of slaves. And uh, the last time I did a cheek swab, I found out that I am 29% uh, European. Uh, so as I tell people, these eyes are not contacts. These are my real, these are my real eyes. I am currently the managing director. Uh, I lead diversity uh, and inclusion uh, for Charles Schwab Company, a great, a great brand. Um, and I tell people that uh, DNI is in my DNA. Um, a lot of years ago, uh, I was part of a diversity and inclusion program aimed at minorities and women of color that State Farm put together. Um, they had a very um, smart leader who realized that his customers were becoming more and more diverse. And he realized that his workforce, especially his leadership, needed to start to mimic and look like that diversity. So I was very, very fortunate to be in the second of that class. Um, I currently reside in San Antonio, Texas. This is my second stint in San Antonio, Texas. Um, and I've lived uh, pretty much all over the US, but there is something about the culture of San Antonio that is 66, 67% Latino. Um, and I have such a great, what I call my familia here, that I am just glad to be back in San Antonio. And I'm just excited to share about my journey and why, why what I do is just so important and so fulfilling to me. So with that, I'll turn it back over to my friend, Brian. Thanks, Bobby. Um, I'm like, we should talk about Texas and Florida where we both live, um, which is a whole conversation. We should talk, <laughs> we should talk about, um, you know, so many things. So I thank you both Andrea again and, uh, and Bobby for being with us. Um, you know, as we step, well, actually, before we do this part, um, I should also share, my name is Brian McComick, he, him pronouns. Um, I am, um, uh, the honor to be the founder of and CEO of Hummingbird Humanity. Uh, I think Andrea's already shared about what we do um, uh, with our consulting practice. Um, and we also have a speakers bureau uh, that is um, part of our, our commitment to amplifying the voices of the unheard. Um, so if you're looking for to learn more about Hummingbird, feel free to reach out to Andrea or me or um, anyone at Hummingbird and we're happy to help. Um, 
On the personal side, I'm an openly gay man. I'm also disabled. Um, I have three invisible disabilities, um, including being HIV positive, which is um, one of the challenges that happens with a lot of gay men um, and certainly communities of color. And um, so that's something that that is important for me to share just to continue to break the stigma. Um, because if we break the stigma, we can help people um, get the, the care and coverage they need. Um, and I'm also I also battle battle mental illness um, again, which is also um, uh, has a higher prevalence in the LGBTQ plus community. So um, those are a couple things about me. Let's uh, first I'm going to say happy Pride. I think I know I said that at the beginning, um, and so that's not the primary focus of this conversation. But the fact that Bobby and I are both gay, we had to make sure we said happy Pride. It is June, um, and for those of you who may not be familiar with Pride, um, Pride started in 1969 with the Stonewall uprising. Stonewall. Um, was started by a group of black and um, brown trans women who um, started who decided to stand up against the police violence that was um, uh, being inflicted upon the LGBTQ plus or the queer community at that time. Um, and that is uh, Pride is the annual celebration of that uprising and is a reminder for us that the work continues to find equality and equity for everyone in the queer community and certainly for communities uh, that have been marginalized for for too many years. Um, and uh, so it's not only, um, so it is a celebration. It's a celebration of us and who we are, um, but it's also um, a reminder that we have to continue to fight. So often the, we hear the parades um, that many of you may have seen and gone to and definitely have fun, um, but they're also marches and marches are there again to remind us of the cause that we're fighting for. So with that, I wanna start the conversation about Juneteenth and Loving Day. Um, Let's, let's, I'm going to go with Andrea again first. So I know Andrea, um, you, well, as we transition here, let's start to just talking about your story, your why is like, you know, and, and I know, of course, I know your story, um, or not all of it, but some of it. So um, would, you, would you like to share a little, little bit about as we sort of transition into Loving Day, why, why your story matters and why, why you choose to be in this work and share your story? Yeah. Um, so similar to, to Bobby, you know, DEI is in my DNA. I think when you're born in a marginalized body, when you're born um, in an othered group, um, it's hard to kind of separate sometimes uh, the personal from, you know, all the other things that it means to be part of a, a larger community. So I think my my why is really about kind of how have I reconciled that Um I think it, it's been quite a journey. I um, shared with some folks um, last month. I was asked, you know, kind of why did you start working in DEI or what is your DEI origin story? And I thought it was such a fascinating question. And the, the first thought that I had in my mind was, um, other than being born in a marginalized body, I got to go to DEI camp when I was in high school, which was like unheard of at the time. Like DEI was not part of curriculums. It was not something that people were talking about. But where I was in um, Eastern Nebraska, in Omaha, um, we brought together students, high school students um, around, uh, we used an acronym called a FASH car. And so it was ableism, uh, classism, racism, faithism, heterosexism, classes, like it was, it was a whole host of things. It was, a, it was an acronym for all the different isms that we were going to be talking about. And so against this backdrop of, you know, summer camp, and singing songs, we were also doing privilege walks and having conversations about hard topics. And I think that was kind of an awakening for me, first time I really felt, um, you know, seen and with my people. And then also kind of this, you know, maybe this is something that I could could do. Um, I mentioned that I um, am a biracial person and my parents' origin story, which um, as we think about Loving Day is, um, really relevant. Um, so I think many people think about Loving Day or people, many people don't know about Loving Day. Let's start there. But for the people who do know about Loving Day, um, they often think that Loving Day is, you know, about love. And it is, it is. But Loving Day is actually a surname um, for Mildred and Richard Loving, um, who were arrested for being an interracial couple in Virginia uh, in 1958. And so they took their court case, um, Lovings versus Virginia, all the way to the Supreme Court. And the ruling struck down um, uh, interracial marriage bans across all of the states. And so uh, that happened in 1967. And my parents were married um, 12 years after that, 1979. So, you know, during my parents' lifetime, it wasn't possible. You know, it was illegal, literally, for them to, to be married. And so... Um, I think about their story 
a lot as, as really kind of my origin story and the courage that it took for them to, to find each other and to get married. Um, there were familiar or family struggles as well. I think my, my parents' family, um, my, my mother's in particular, was not supportive of the marriage um, and didn't attend the wedding. Um, and so that was really difficult. Um, and then when they did come around to, to the wedding um, and to the marriage um, a few years later, so they were kind of estranged for a little while, um, they were like, oh, well, but don't have children because um, that would be that would be wrong. Um, but five years after they were married, along came myself and my brother. And um, so it was a big part of, you know, kind of our, our upbringing of being kind of in an interracial family. And, and I think for me, because it was my normal, you know, I didn't know any different. I didn't have, you know, parents that were of the same race. That was just what I was born into. Um, I really didn't think much of it until I was school aged and another child kind of pointed out to me like, oh, like, hey, like, look, mommy, those two don't match. Like, Andrea doesn't match her mommy. Um, and I was like, oh, oh, crap. Like, I don't match my mommy. Like, so now I was being found out or now I was being called out and something that I didn't even know was, was weird. Um, and so I think that kind of started this journey of, you know, both being um, invisible and that people didn't really know what to do with me. And I was often left out of uh, play groups or social circles and conversations, um, but also highly visible because of this unique identity that I had. People could never quite place me with my hair and my skin and my facial features. Um, they weren't, you know, she's, she's not all black, but I don't think she's, you know, white either. And, and, and Asian wasn't even on the table until they saw my mother. So it was a whole, it was a whole thing. And so I think really flash forward to that DEI camp when I was in high school, that really provided me um, with space and language to, to be able to, to start to process and talk about and, and build relationships and build a sense of pride going back to, to the pride conversation a little bit um, and who I was and wanting to kind of pursue um, exploring that identity more and helping others to maybe go through that journey a little bit faster than I did. So I'll pause there for now, but that's a little bit of loving day and my origin story together. <laughs> oh, Brian, are you on mute? Uh, thank you for letting me know I was in the mute. I've tried to, uh, it, I'm sure we've all done that a few times in the last three years. So we're familiar. Um, you know, before we um, uh, go over to Bobby to talk about Juneteenth, um, you know, Andrea, I'm curious how, um, you know, the experiences that your parents have had and how you've, you know, the stories you've learned from them, how that has influenced how you are raising your kids and how you and your husband show yeah. up in the world and, um, and how, and how, like, because I, you know, I didn't even really think about it until we started the prep for this of like, I'm like, I just think of Andrea and Greg and like, I'm, you know, there's mm. there people I know. And, but I'm like, there's a whole story there that I, that I'm like, I haven't asked about. So. Yeah. Yeah. So um, what I didn't share, my husband is also white. So not only am I, you know, kind of a child of an interracial marriage, I am now a partner in an interracial marriage and a mother of, of interracial multiracial children. Um, we affectionately call them pandas because they're black, white, and Asian, um, which I think is okay for us to say, but maybe not for other people to say. So I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> but um, you know, it's, it's an interesting, Interesting one. I think um, if I'm really being honest and transparent about it, there's there was a piece of me when I was in high school. You know, high school was such a formative experience, right? I think everybody has, you know, kind of their high school memories. Um, I'm getting ready for my 20 year high school reunion this summer, which is uh, devastating, but it's going to be fine. Um, but anyways, I, I didn't date much when I was in, in high school. Um, I went to a predominantly white school. White boys didn't really know what to do with me in, in school. It's kind of that, again, very visible because I knew that Andrea was, you know, different. I could see her and she stood out in the crowd, but also invisible and in that I was kind of on the outside of a lot of the things that were happening socially. Um, and so I, I think, you know, there was a piece of me, you know, when I, I got married and started dating, I, I, I've dated multiple different races, but there was a part of kind of that relationship where there had to be some healing after so much rejection, you know, from from white men, essentially, as a heterosexual woman um, that I had to kind of process and get over with with Greg. But I do know, like, when we when we go out places, you know, most of the time, kind of like what you said, Brian, like, I don't really think about it. Um, I try not to think consciously about, you know, the fact that our family is this kind of patchwork family where we all have different colors and different hair and different you know tones and textures to it to our, our family but um we do occasionally get kind of the 
the stairs and like the, like, is that your child or are you the nanny? You know, when I'm out with my daughters in particular who have a much fairer complexion than I do. Um, when I got married um, to Greg, my, my maiden name is Williams, which is a much easier, easier last name than Borscht. <laughs> um, I changed my name selfishly because I wanted to move up in the alphabet. But again, that's a story for a different day. But when I got married, though, I remember thinking it's important for me to have the same last name if I have children, because I don't want anybody to think about these children not being mine. I don't want people to see Andrea Williams and Dash Forscht or Mia Forscht or Isla Forscht and think they don't match. And so those aren't the kids. And so, again, that matching story from when I was in kindergarten has stayed with me mm. to the point of being in a place where not only do I know that I biologically claim my kids, but I want to have documentation and proof in the form of a shared surname um, because of our appearance as a couple so um, and as a family. So just different things that kind of cross my mind as I think about, you know, what does it mean to be in an interracial family? But um, the other thing I'll add really quickly too is just, I, I think about just representation and, and I think it's gotten easier as people see more families that have mixed race um, parents and mixed race children um, in the media. So, you know, thinking about it in movies and TV shows and books. And so being able to show that to my kids and to normalize it for them, I think is also part of kind of the healing journey and kind of making sure that they feel seen, recognized, valued, um, and not othered. And, and I, I feel like they feel, I hope that they're feeling safe and cared for and um, confident in, in who they are as little people as they kind of continue to, to grow and develop. That's one more question before I go to Bobby, because I have to ask it. And, and the uh, um, Andrea, I I'm wondering, how, have, do your kids come home with questions that they're like, mm. like our, our friends are asking about this? Why, why mom, mom, your mom and dad look different from each other? Are those the conversations? Do those things happen? It hasn't um, so much for my end. What's interesting is so in the same way that I look different from my daughters, my son looks different from my, my my husband. Um, my son has very similar coloring to me. He's got black hair and, and more tan skin. My husband is, um, you know, brown hair, blue eyed, very pale, complected. And so like, there's a little bit of a, a disconnect. And I don't think necessarily that Dash has come home with that. But I think what's been more acute for my kids is, is the skin tone and the skin color. Um, my mother's from the Philippines and in Filipino culture, there is a, and even in the black culture, there is a strong degree of colorism. Um, you know, my mom is a fair complected Filipino woman and she always would stay out of the sun because being tan was less desirable than being fair skinned. And the same thing kind of exists within, um, the black culture too, I would say, um, as well. Um, my, my son will come home and, and he'll, you know, recognize that my daughters are treated differently. Um, than he is because they are fair skinned. And so I think he's already, he will say things sometimes like, you know, like I wish I was light like daddy and, and those things break my heart because there's already, already a value associated with it. And so I think those are things that we're starting to kind of um, tear down. I think now that he's almost nine, he'll be nine um, in a couple of days here. I think he's starting to kind of have more conversations with his friends. He's lucky enough to go to a very diverse school. And so like, it's not like it's coming up, like he's the only, or it's weird. And there's, there's other multiracial families there. So I think that's great. Um, but I think that the colorism thing is something that we're not quite able to, to kind of easily um, kind of fix or, or go over. So that's something where there's a lot of intentionality around how we're talking about that with our kids. Mm. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you again for sharing, choosing to share your stories. I know, you know that's a that's an in, a conscious and intentional choice, and not always easy. So thank you for being here. And um, you know, something that as you were listening, I just I'll, and I'll put a link in the the chat. Um, it rem reminded me of the when I read Cast, the origins of our discontent, and yeah. understood how um, skin color is the a foundational reality of how our country thinks about you know the other the humans and each other and um and that's not really honoring the reality of the pain that and suffering that is comes with that so for anyone who hasn't read cast and doesn't understand how um you know the darker complexion complexion is is less desirable in the united states and why that where that origin originated that story that book is powerful and painful mm -hmm. and worth every page and every word hundred percent. I'll offer one more book recommendation too. When I was, um, again, I feel like I keep talking about high school. I don't know if it's just because that reunion's coming up or what, but um, there is a book called Black, White, and Jewish written by Rebecca Walker, who's the daughter of Alice Walker. And that was one of the first 
books, um, memoirs that I had written, or I didn't write that, read <laughs> about a person um, with a mixed race heritage. And I think there's a lot of uh, myself that I saw in that story. And so if you're interested in learning more kind of about the nuances of, of growing up kind of intersectional, racial, cultural identities, um, that would be a really great one to, to throw up there as well. Excellent. Thanks, Andrea. Okay, it's not the Andrea show. No, it's a. Uh, it, it, <laughs> I listen. I could sit here and just uh, you know take in with the rest of the audience because this is great. So yeah, awesome. Yeah, and well, and you know, and for those of you who are like they're talking about the serious stuff and they're also enjoying have some moments of levity. And I, I you know, I I can't speak for Andrea and Bobby, but my guess is we would all say we have to find levity and joy in the course of the pain and the the hurt and the and the work that we do to help to make the world better for everyone like it's we have to find that balance so which i think is an interesting uh, segue to juneteenth um bobby do you want to share with us a little bit about um you know your why and your story and and then you know why juneteenth is important to you and why you choose to do this work yeah and and just before i do that since everybody's throwing out books uh you know you you made me think of another book there's a guy named steve stout steve stout is a music uh, executive producer, a music icon. Uh, he hangs around with the types of Beyonce and Jay-Z. Steve wrote a book several years ago, and I'm trying to remember the exact title, but it's about the tanning of America and how hip hop has influenced this breaking down of walls and barriers of color with all of the different uh, dimensions of our society. So it's just a, a very fascinating book about how, you know, I take Andrea as a perfect example and her children. Our kids are becoming more and more, the, the future generation is becoming more and more tan. There's not gonna be black, white, Asian. It's gonna be this, as I call it, because I love the city of New Orleans, our, our kids are gonna be a gumbo of all of our special cultures. So. Uh, just another book that I would recommend that I that uh, it's been several years, but it's very good reading. Um, I you know why Juneteenth is important to me as I as I said in my opening, um, I am descent I am a descendant of slaves. I have a cousin Regina who did uh, our genealogy, and it's just fascinating to hear some of the stories of when she went into old courthouses and she's trying to find all these records of these slaves and. And, you know, slaves are sometimes listed in the same section as property when you go into courthouses and you're trying to find their their uh, their their lineage. And it's, you know, they're called colored or mulatto. It's very interesting. But um, I, my great great grandfather was actually what what my cousin has found is he was a plantation owner and being a plantation owner. He was married to a wife. And for whatever reason, his wife could not bear children. So he had two sons with one of his slaves that he took as his own kids. And what my cousin has been able to find out through that as, as, as the plantation grew and the, my great great grandfather got owner and he at older and he passed away, he had actually had the forethought to have a will put together. And in that will, he left his plantation and most all of his possessions to his two sons and I think it was Sally was the slave's name. But here was an interesting point back in those days. His sons, even though they were his biological sons, were still considered property. And you could not leave property to property. So uh, his family actually uh, was able to take most of his plantation, but they did parse out some for, for his sons. So Juneteenth is relevant to me because, again, I, I come from descendants of slaves. It's also actually interesting that I live in the state, Texas, uh, where, where, where we had to send Union troops almost two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation was signed in 19, or 1863, that we had to send Union soldiers uh, to, to Galveston Bay, Texas to, to say, hey, you know, the, the slaves are slaves slaves are slaves are free so that's that's why it's so uh that's why it's just so relevant to me it's just based really on my on my family history um i also think it's interesting you know listen to andrea when i think about my grandmother's side of the family also so here's a uh, I, don't, I don't say it's a family secret anymore but my family on my grandfather's side and my grandmother's side my grandfather and my grandmother were actually cousins 
So back in the days where the slaves were freed and they were able to go out, you know, they were told they were going to get their 40 acres and their mule. They didn't get those, but they, they had to go out and make for themselves. My grandfather used to say that back in those days, uh, when you wanted to get married because there was so much, you were so close to your family, you just try to go to the furthest holler. That's what we used to call it in Kentucky or the furthest side of the mountain and try to marry the person that is the furthest away from you. Uh, and that was my grandmother. My grandmother's side of the family were very, very light complexion. As a matter of fact, some on my grandmother's side of the family could pass, right? Mm -hmm. we, and if you don't know what pass means, they were so light and fair complected that they could pass for Caucasian. Um, and I remember my grandmother used to tell me some of the stories of her. I think she had 11 brothers and sisters and how how much lighter some of her brothers and sisters were. But that's where these, I, I, I am told, that's where these light brown eyes come, uh, mm -hmm. come in. They were green when I was born, and now as I get older, they're, they're brown. Uh, but that is my connection, not only to loving, but also to, June, uh, to, to Juneteenth. I think Juneteenth is, is such an important um, history lesson for us. As I think about the word woke and how the word woke has been monopolized and, and how it's been used out of the context. You know, again, woke is just an understanding of what your history was. So you make sure that you don't repeat the mistakes of the past. And I think Juneteenth is a perfect example of how a message for people to be liberated and to be free, yet they were not free. Some say we're still not free, but they were not free everywhere. It's just a it's just a message for us that because we have some privileges that we may have in some inner cities, um, that those privileges still sometimes don't extend to us to us all always. And I think Juneteenth is just a great example of again how we can think about um, understanding the past so we don't repeat those mistakes so we continue to be better in the future. It's one of the things that just it motivates me about the space that I am so fortunate to work in, the space of diversity and inclusion. It is not easy. Uh, my team, it's a Tuesday. So on Tuesdays, my team, we share these things. We call those Teaching Tuesdays. And a couple of my teammates today were sharing story, these, these articles about cliffs, right? There is the purple cliff or there is the black cliff that men and women are put on these cliffs to see if you can succeed. And sometimes the cliffs are so steep that you can't. And I say that I feel like every day I am on a cliff and it has nothing to do with who I work with. It's just the space that I work in, especially as we think about an election coming up. And there are some candidates that are going to make culture. They're going to bring culture into politics and demonize culture uh, to, to advance a political, you know, to, uh, a, a political strategy, a political position. And it's just tough in the space that we work in. I, I wear this little badge uh, that I made for my team. And I call those Jedi badges. Jedi, because I'm kind of a Star Wars nerd. But Jedi meaning justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And I call my team Jedi Warriors because I feel like every day we're in this, I hate to say a fight, but it is a fight. It is a fight to make lives equitable, to make lives fair, uh, to make lives, especially in corporate America, that folks can have an opportunity to do their very, very, very best. And when I talk about the space of diversity and inclusion, I talk about it that, that most organizations do it for two reasons. I talk about uh, uh, the, the right reasons and the smart reasons. And sometimes folks only per focus on the right reasons. The right reasons you do diversity, equity, and inclusion. And again, just to provide fairness so that everybody has a fair opportunity to be themselves and make a contribution in the workplace, that they can feel a sense of belonging, that they can feel a sense of inclusion. I, I say to folks, it's not to put, it's not to give anybody an advantage. It's just to remove disadvantage so the, the race is fair, which leads you to the smart reasons to do diversity, equity, and inclusion. There are a number of uh, big consulting firms, Gartner and Deloitte and McKinsey, that has been studying the effects that organizations that embrace diversity, equity, and inclusion from a gender and an ethnicity perspective, that they outperform their competitors in that same quadrant. 
So if you want to make the correlation why this is important, because if you're a stock company, if you're a CEO of a stock company, or if you own a large, you run a large P&L, it actually makes you better. It actually makes you, it, it actually helps you. It's, it's an arrow in the quiver to help you hit those long-term uh, financial goals for a stockholder or for your, for your long-term strategy. And I tell people all the time, don't believe me because I'm passionate about it. Believe the research that has been reviewed, that has been published in Harvard Business Review, that's been peer reviewed. Believe that research. That's why. So if you I, I say to people all the time, if you don't want to do it for the right reasons, then my goodness, if you truly believe in our capitalist society and an entrepreneur, then do it for the smart reasons, because it will. If you trust the research, which I do. Right. It will make you better. It will make your brand better. It will give your employees a sense of belonging and innovation that they will they will they will they will jump hurdles to take care of your customer clients, your strategy and help you hit your benchmark. So um, you can tell I get very passionate about this. Uh, that's just because I believe in it so much. We're going to be pulling that clip and sharing it on all our social media every day, forever and ever. Um, just because, just, just remind everyone of what it's all about. So I, you know, I, I love, I love that at Hummingbird we, we use a phrase called "good for humanity, good for business." Like, if, if if you're in it just because you want to celebrate and honor humanity, great. If you're in it because you think it's good for business, great. If you're in it for both, that's even better. But. I don't care why you're here, really. I'm just glad we're doing the work and we're making some change happen. So, um, and you know, and, and it's and the reality is, I, I uh, as Andrea knows, I like to focus on the humanity part because that's just like that's where my heart is and that's what I believe in. And um, but I also get like, in, in, for leaders who are decision makers, we have a responsibility to make good business decisions. So understanding there is an ROI is also okay to acknowledge and an honor because that it is our responsibility to run organizations that are healthy and thriving because that also and, serves the people. And how awesome is it, Brian? Just what you said, I'm going to paraphrase it. How awesome when you can do both. Yes. How awesome when you can do when you can do both just to embrace and to be able to do both. You talk about a win-win scenario, or you talk about one plus one equals three. That's what this is, right? I love that. I love I love when fuzzy math like gets us better numbers. So it's good stuff. I'm um, from Kentucky, so math, you know, it's fuzzy. So I'm from. Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there, there was a comment in the chat um, from someone who said, and I will say that I was one of these. I was like this uh, Rosemary who says, "I have to admit that I never heard of Juneteenth until a few years mm -hmm. ago, and I can't believe how long it took for this to be recognized." Um, I will say ditto. And, um, you know, of course, this is being a diversity, equity, and inclusion professional, I learn all the time. And this is one of many things. And I'm curious what the two of you think, because this, you know, as members of the community that, well, I, I think celebrating freedom is something we can all celebrate in the United States. And this was, you know, as, as the origin of this is, the, is a event to celebrate the end of slavery. And, you know, how does, how does that question resonate for you? And how do you think about that, that, that reality? I can take a stab. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's interesting. I, I think, you know, I, my, my dad is, is a black man. He's also our family's descendants of slaves as well. Um, we haven't gone as far as the genealogy though. And I'm very curious. That might be something that I, I attempt maybe, um, maybe this year, maybe I'll make that a goal for the end of this year. Um, but what I, I will say is that my, my family didn't grow up celebrating Juneteenth. And then it wasn't necessarily something that we read about in, in our history books either. Like, I think, you know, Black history and my education system was MLK, Ruby Bridges, Jackie Robinson, you know, and then Obama. <laughs> and that was basically kind of it. Maybe there was a blip on, on slavery in there, but it was a sensitive topic. And, and I remember whenever it did come up in school, everybody would just kind of like look over at Andrea and like, and then like, like I don't know, like I know as much as you know, like we're, we're learning together. Um, and, and so I, I think so much of our, our history wasn't, shared with us, you know, and so there's many black people and then it, we kind of, I have these like tentative conversations with folks like, did you know about Juneteenth? Like, did you celebrate Juneteenth? Like before like 2020, when everybody started celebrating Juneteenth, um, you know, and then the conversations are usually like, 
you know, no, like it wasn't something that was big for us. And, and there's a few people that, yes, this is a big part of their family tradition. My family, I'm actually getting ready to go this weekend. We have a 50 plus year family reunion um, that happens over 4th of July weekend. And, and so that's really kind of been kind of the big family get together, the big family celebration. But a lot of those same themes of, you know, kind of pride in our community, you know, kind of recognizing how far we've come, honoring our history are all kind of part of what we do during that celebration. But I do think that, you know, I'm making a conscious effort now as an adult, you know, to make sure that this is a different reality for my my kids. I keep going back to them. And so um, Juneteenth has been, you know, reading books. We sat and we read about Opal Lee, the, the, the grandmother, the godmother of, of Juneteenth, who really fought to get it recognized as a as a national holiday, um, you know, celebrating with the different kinds of foods that we're eating. So it's a tradition with Juneteenth to be able to um, eat red food. So you see a lot of red meat, red beans and rice, red velvet cake, strawberry soda. Those are all traditional, um, you know, kind of, you know, silly a little bit, but like traditional foods that are typically eaten, kind of representing the red and the Juneteenth flag and, and kind of the power, the struggle, um, the liberation kind of all symbolized with that red color. And so with my kids, you know, having them, you know, pick out red food to be able to eat or enjoy is kind of how we, we choose to celebrate it. So we're, we're meeting them where they're at at nine, five, and two. Um, but, you know, hopefully being able to, to dial up that recognition, dial up that celebration as they get older so that this becomes part of their, their practice. But Bobby, what was it like for you and your family? No, I, and so Andrew, very similar to you. Uh, growing up, I didn't know about Juneteenth. I grew up in a small little town uh, in Kentucky called Stanford, Kentucky, 45 minutes south east of Lexington, um, I can count the number of black folks uh, in my high school, you know, on both on both of my hands. So Juneteenth, the hit that history was something that was not taught in our in our American history. I didn't find out about what Juneteenth was. It was kind of weird uh, until I was uh, about ready to graduate from college and I was on vacation uh, with some friends golfing down in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. And lo and behold, there was a big celebration going on with a lot of motorcycles and a lot of people in town. And someone said, oh, that's a Juneteenth celebration. And I had no idea what it was until then. And then I had to find out about it. So for the person who was in the chat that that didn't know about Juneteenth, I will tell you there are still a lot of people who don't know about it. Uh, there are still a lot of people, a lot of black folks that don't know about it. And even if they know there's a holiday called Juneteenth, they don't know about the history of, of, you know, it took two and a half years after Emancipation Proclamation signed for slaves to know they are free. Um, it's interesting also, and Andrea mentioned that uh, Opal Lee, uh, who was a school teacher, you know, not surprising, it took a school, a, a school teacher <laughs> to help us understand the history and the lesson around Juneteenth, who really started this campaign. Um, that 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 she, she started at 89 years old, that she wanted to walk the to, from uh, Fort Worth, Texas to Washington, D.C. to raise more awareness about it. Um, and I think, and, and it's interesting that uh, I think she is in her early 90s now, and she is still on the circuit, still being a teacher teaching us about Juneteenth and why Juneteenth is so, why it's such an important part of our history. I like to celebrate Juneteenth by finding a festival, whatever city that I'm living in. We had a festival here in San Antonio when I lived in Denver uh, uh, in the area called Five Points. If anybody's on the line from Denver, they would always have an amazing Juneteenth celebration where you go. And I, I told you that I'm a person of faith. So gospel music is something that I get a lot of energy and power from. And that's usually how I celebrate Juneteenth. Also, just by helping others to understand uh, what Juneteenth I heard a lady, and you know, you shouldn't watch TikTok too much, but I heard a lady on TikTok the other day talk about, I don't understand what the importance of Juneteenth is and why we celebrate Juneteenth. Um, and um, I, I say to myself, because this is just who I am, I'm not the person that would respond negatively to that person, but I am someone who would say, you know what, I'd love to sit down and have coffee with you and say why Juneteenth is important. Because I think, I think that's how you bring in more more warriors to this battle, this Jedi battle, is you've got to help educate others on on all of our history and why all of our history is important for us. So many good tidbits and, and insights and words of wisdom. And again, like the, the sharing your personal stories and helping us understand. And, you know, that's one of the things that I, I'll, I'll encourage uh, for those of you that are with us either today live or watching later is, 
um, you know, what, what, what of the foundational beliefs and how we do our work at Hummingbird is very much about like what Andrea and, and Bobby are demonstrating here is like sharing their stories. And, I, and I'm seeing some of the questions, which we're going to get to in the chat, that your stories are sparking. And, um, and so we, we, one of the things we really believe is, is as we start to learn about each other as just humans and our stories, then we can start to learn more about that, that history. And then we can start to be part of the change that we need to make. And it's the collection of all of those individual actions, those moments of listening, of curiosity, Curiosity that lead to then doing something meaningful that then lead to change, um, and you know. So I'll, I'll start there, um, and I'll ask you, I'll ask you this question, um, Andrea, as a starting point of you know. There's Madeline talks about um, the importance of individual action. So we you know I know that we talk we work with organizations, um, but the organizations are full of humans that are all individuals. So how do you, how what would you offer there? So I I think that that's an interesting question. I think one of the maybe a build on that question is, you know, kind of you see these corporate, you know, kind of celebrations of, of Juneteenth or Pride Month. Um, and then, you know, maybe it's kind of like a one-time shot or we hear a lot about like rainbow washing where all the logos go to, to rainbows, you know, kind of during the month of June and then everything goes back. And I, I think what I encourage folks to think about is, is there, yes, there is something about celebration and the symbolism and kind of that visible allyship that where it starts to creep into performative allyship is where I start to worry. And how we prevent that from happening is when there are actions within organizations that undergird, you know, kind of that, that rainbow celebration or that Juneteenth celebration. So how are we supporting our LGBTQ plus employees? How are we supporting our black employees? How are we thinking about what does advancement look like? What does pay equity look like? Um, or thinking about, you know, kind of how are we impacting the individuals? Because when I think the outward expression, you talk about this a lot, Brian, when the outward expression of, of DEI doesn't match the inward expression of DEI, then it's incongruent and it leads to hurt feelings. It leads to um, mistrust in the organization when the insides don't match the outsides and what's being projected. And so I think that's one way to kind of look at it from a corporate space. But I, I do think, you know, a lot of this is individual action. Um, I would love to say that, you know, our, our government is going to come together and like, we're going to figure all of this out and we're going to fix all the systemic things that are happening in place. And maybe one day we'll get to that spot. But I think in the meantime, it really is up to us to kind of create the change that we want to see to quote Gandhi, right? Um, you know, how do we become, you know, kind of the stewards of the messages and the values that we hold? Um, and how do we kind of start to create those ripple effects within the communities? And so for me, you know, that, that's starting with my family. That's, you know, the, the profession that I've chosen is kind of the way that I've, you know, decided to kind of make an impact for other people. It might look a little bit different. And so I think if we just, you know, use what we have and do what we can, um, it helps to make you know, the impact and, and over time, you know, those little pebbles will start to turn into bigger rocks and then bigger boulders and we'll start to really be able to move some mountains. I love that. I love that. And uh, Bobby, certainly if you have anything to add about the, the sort of the, how to think about it from this individual actions perspective, I'm curious. I, I, I'd also, I'm curious what you do at your organization for Juneteenth, if, if you can share with us, uh, you know, because I know that's a question we get is um, in our consulting firm is, you know, what do we, what do we celebrate? How do we choose to celebrate? And, and there's a, a conversation about, should we close the business on the day on Juneteenth? And um, so I have 17 questions for you there. I'm going to let you just figure out where you go. <laughs> so, 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 so two things I'll, I'll uh, back to the, the individual and how you could uh, individualize. And I say this for corporations also, uh, you know, most everybody will be familiar with the quote that uh, Dr. Maya Angelou said about, you know, people will forget what you said to them. People will never forget how you make them feel. I, I tell folks who are at organizations that is the same thing for, for organizations, right? The uh, another term, Andrea, is the diversity dishonesty that some companies want to do with window dressing. Mm -hmm. um, that that people can see through that right and so i tell organizations be careful what you put yourself out there for because that you will be held accountable for that i started my career and i'm not pitching brands because i don't work there anymore but i started my career at state farm insurance and everybody knows state farm they know jake but they also know like a good neighbor state farm is there and state farm knew that it is how you make people feel if you can make people feel that, that you're like their neighbor, right? That, that that becomes sticky and they appreciate your brand. And Andrea used the word trust. 
that they trust your brand. I try, I tell people what I do right now for a living, I tell people I'm just trying to get to heaven. And I believe in order to get to heaven, you've got to do things for people who can't do anything back for you in return. You've got to try to make people's lives better. And that's what I try to do through this, this, um, this work. I almost said ministry, but it's not a ministry. Uh, it's this passion that I do around diversity, equity, and inclusion. So that's, that's why it's important. That's how I individualize it. To myself and then I I just try to be as transparent you see I got these blue nails on uh, I, I don't try to hide where who I am or what I am right um, someone asked if I would ever go back in the closet I'm like I don't know where those closet doors are I blew the whole wall out I, I would I, I can't I can't ever go back in the closet what we do uh, at Schwab uh, for Juneteenth of course it's a federal holiday so all of our employees have that holiday off and we encourage our employees to celebrate with their loved ones and family, however they want to celebrate Juneteenth. What I'm so proud, I'm, I'm proud of a lot of things working at Charles Schwab, but one of the things that I'm proud about at Charles Schwab is that our, our Black ERG, our Charles Schwab Black Professionals, is our oldest employee resource group. It is our numero uno, our firstborn, and it is our oldest that is 30 years old. And our leadership and our and our black employee resource group, they do so, so much to help not only prepare to celebrate uh, uh, Juneteenth, uh, but they also uh, encourage folks to take that celebration outside of Schwab and help to educate others about the value of Juneteenth. So I'm so very proud of our of our our black professionals at Charles Schwab and our group there, um, because you know that's what we do. Uh, we can always do more. Uh, but that's what we do at Charles Schwab to celebrate uh, to celebrate Juneteenth. Thank you, thank you for sharing, uh, Andrea. Um, would you offer any any any? I know you're actually in the midst of writing a message <laughs> to our community about how to make these choices okay. and decisions. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> anything you want to add to this? Um, you know, I, it's. Uh, yes, I mean, I think everything Bobby said is 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 spot on. I, I think it's you know just how do we. Um, I guess what I would add would be more around just you, you don't have to do everything. Like there's so much. I think in the beginning of this, you had a slideshow and you had, you know, I, I don't even know how many 15, 20 things that are happening in June alone. Um, and that's just one month out of a, out of a year. Um, and I think a lot of Tim's companies are looking to say, you know, like there's so much, like how do I make sure that I'm doing the right things and kind of at what level am I doing them? And, and kind of who is my audience? Is this internal? Is this external? Is this a message? Is this a event? Um, and there's not going to be a one size fits all no. solution for, for everybody. I, I think what I have been coaching the different clients that we've been working with on has been around, um, you know, just making sure that you, you make some clear decisions, you have some clear boundaries, some clear guidelines about what you're doing, and you're transparent about why you're making those decisions. Um, recognizing that it's going to be an iterative process, like maybe this year, you know, we, we get it right. Maybe we have like an amazing event with a speaker. And so maybe that's something that we replicate. Maybe we have um, an event that maybe doesn't have as much attendance, or maybe a message doesn't land, or maybe we missed something that was really important to our, our employees. How do we take those lessons um, learned, you know, and kind of incorporate them in, in for next year? How do we bring people into those conversations? You know, um, what's important to our employees? How do we understand our employee base and what's going to be valuable to them, either based on their identities or based on, you know, other parts, you know, that maybe we're not as, um, you know, kind of visually able to kind of read in like a demographics page or something like that. But it's something that, you know, our employees are, are telling us that is important to them. Um, I think those are all things that I would, that I would raise and encourage and, um, you know, start, start small, you know, kind of see where the energy is and kind of follow the energy. I think your employees will really help to, to lead you uh, in the right direction. Um, so that's what I guess I would offer to the conversation. Brian, can I offer one more thing? I think it's always important. What, what I try to do, and I, it doesn't mean I'm always successful at it, but I always try to do, I, I use the word grace a lot. I always try to give folks grace also. We talked a little bit earlier about trying to meet people where they are. Sometimes folks just don't understand. Sometimes they will ask the question that comes off that could be a little offensive or, but I just I also try to give grace because giving that grace is the only, again, it is not the only way, but it's a great way of helping people understand the value that they can bring 
into a conversation, into a celebration around Juneteenth. So I also, I always try to keep that grace in mind because again, what I want to do is I want to bring more warriors into this, not exclude folks out of it. Yeah. 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 Um, we have five yeah. minutes left um, and I have another 152 questions. Um, so um, I do want to ask um, one question and then we'll do our we'll then we'll we'll go to the wrap up um because I, I, this one feels um really important actually i'm going to say one thing first which is you know something that i know andrea and i have talked about in our work of how um how do we um think about like similar to this conversation around how do companies make choices um about how they honor the different lived experiences and you know our, our the way that one of the approaches we take at hummingbird is that we really want to expand the perspective of we of the variety of lived experiences that are part of our, the unique realities of the humans that enter your organizations and that's important to us and we also don't want to lose sight of the reality that skin color is the, you know, I think Andrea, the, I, I, I always hear that you say this over and over and over. It doesn't matter what your identity is. If you are black, there was the outcomes of your, of your life in, in our society in the United States, and this can be true other places as well, is going to be worse. Um, and, uh, you know, I think about in the queer community, you know, one of the things that I, um, you know, I used to, when I, when I was thinking about celebrating pride, I would think about people who look like me. I wasn't, I didn't intend to exclude other people or not think about them, but I've learned since then, like, I, I, that's not my role here. My role is to elevate the stories of black and brown queer people and transgender women of color who still have a life expectancy under 35 um, because of how they're treated in our society. And, you know, those are the things, stories we need to emerge. And we have to, and again, you know, I'll go back to like, they're also the community that started Pride and the Stonewall Uprising. So we have to honor their stories. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that piece of the puzzle. And um, and, and it's an, such an important piece that we have to like, you know, uh, that I encourage everyone to, to learn about, whether it's reading cast or reading Black, White and Jewish. Um, Maybe the book Bobby mentioned, but um, you know, you know, read the, read these books and learn about these stories. Um, and also, that which leads into the question I want to ask is, you know, you'd both choose to share your stories, and you know, we encourage people to learn, but not everyone signed up for this. Hey, Dash. Hey. Um, <laughs> Holding my Lego ninja star. Okay. It's okay, no worries. But not everyone signed up for this. So, what what advice would you give people who are like, oh, I have this black person who sits in the cubicle next to me. I'll ask them about Juneteenth, and I'll, I'll they'll share their story. And like, how do we how do we help avoid those moments of discomfort and pain? Mm. Sorry, I was distracted by my child just jumping into the, the screen here for a second. But uh, the question, yes, hi, Dash, <laughs> um, is is the question is about how do we avoid kind of moments of discomfort when having kind of yeah, and like how do you like I know lean into like asking like the yeah. people like we've signed up for it all of us in this room yeah. but not everyone did. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's you know entering the conversations with with a sense of curiosity. I think is really important to me. You know, just kind of like you know like. I'd love to hear your story. What I, I often get asked for informational interviews to kind of learn about my career trajectory. And what I tell people is go ask other people because people love telling their story. People love talking about themselves. So like ask, ask, you know, so when you say tell my story, let me tell me your story, you know, and then start to kind of dig into like, okay, like say more about this. Like I'd love to hear more about that. And you start to kind of peel back the onion, you know, that people, you know, kind of are, you know, the, the layers. Um, you'll get to see some things about them maybe that you wouldn't necessarily get to in, in kind of just surface level conversations. But I think when you take the time to be curious, um, I think when you're looking to, you know, learn, I think, you know, around Juneteenth and those kinds of things, I think it's important to come to the table with some research of your own. Um, you know, there's so much available to you, you know, kind of on the internet and on your cell phones and all the things. So the amount of information available to you is vast. And so I, I always find it more um, comfortable when people, you know, kind of come to me and say, hey, Andrea, like, I was reading about Loving Day, for example, and I read this stuff, like, I find it really interesting. Like, can you, you know, maybe share your thoughts on maybe this particular part of that story, or maybe, you know, that maybe will provide an opportunity for me to kind of, um, you know, add, add some nuance to it. Because I, I don't think we should ever depend on people to, to teach us everything. But I think if we come with a little bit of, you know, self-education and a curiosity, um, and some grace. I, I love that we're keeping that word on the table here. Um, I think those conversations end up in a much better place. 
Yeah, I, I, I agree. I love the word if you come from a point of curiosity. Uh, Brian, I'm trying to remember uh, on one of the earlier slides, um, embrace, uh, unite, and celebrate. Or I might have those in a different order, but I know I think I have the three of those right. But I think if we are truly, if we're truly going to hit those, embrace, celebrate, unite, I think coming from a place of curiosity and then that person receiving that, giving that person some grace, I think that's how we accomplish, we get to that place of celebrate, unite. That's how we get there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think the, the only agreed with everything that Bobby and Andrea have said, and I think the only thing I would add to that is um, just because the person happens to be in your orbit, if you don't have a relationship with them, don't enter a conversation that is sensitive and personal until you have some trust. Um, because we're sharing our stories requires some trust, even for those of us who are get paid for it for a living um, and choose to do it. So, um, and, but, you know, th but when you have a little bit of trust then that curiosity goes a long way and we're, grateful that you're you're in part of the conversation and want to help uh, be part of the change so um I, it's 301 we have to wrap up but i want to just make sure we don't miss the final question here which is the two part um one andrea bobby how do people reach you connect with you find you if they want to reach out and what's bringing you joy today so bobby i'll let you go first uh, easy to connect with me on linkedin uh if you're friends with brian uh you can find me I love to make uh, friends on LinkedIn. So very easy to, uh, to find me on LinkedIn. Uh, I am a forever optimist. So what brings me joy is every day I wake up, I find a reason to try to make a difference for someone else. That is what, that is what brings me joy is if I can make a difference, a positive influence in someone else's life, then my goodness, uh, uh, good job. Yeah. Love that. Um, what was the first question? I'm sorry, I've got mommy brain, Brian. What was the first? No I have the last one. I don't have no the first worries. question. Well, Where you can they find me? Is that it's, it? it's, it's probably not the best uh, the skill of a host to like. Let me give you seven <laughs> questions all at once. Please memorize them and go. Um, so, how do people find you, and yes. what's bringing you joy? Yes, um, LinkedIn is going to be the best spot for me. So, um, just really simple, Andrea Forscht, no C. Everybody likes to put a C in there, but you won't find me if you put the C. So, just Forscht, S H T. Um, and then, what's bringing me joy? My family is bringing me joy today. We've got a lot of um, family events coming up. I mentioned that family reunion. It's my son's birthday. We have a big family trip coming up, and just spending a lot of quality time with my family um, is really what I'm looking forward to. Making some memories and. Um, really just embracing uh, the people that I love most. Thank you both. Thank you both. Well, and I'll share that what's bringing me joy today. Well, first, you can also find me on LinkedIn um, um, and uh, Hummingbird Humanity. So, um, and uh, uh, we'll also be posting um, this, the recording for this uh, session. And so please, I know we saw someone, saw someone that was going to share it with their ERGs. Like, please share it, share it out. Let others learn and from um, Andrea and, and Bobby. Um, that's, and that's why we do these, host these conversations is so we can um, be part of the work and the learning. So, um, you know, thank you for being with us and thank you for sharing. Andrea and, and Bobby, thank you for, for being with us today. Um, and what's bringing me joy, it, I'll say that really is this, con like this conversation of, you know, as I am continue my journey of learning and trying to be a person who is part of the change, I, you know, thank you for, for, for sharing so I can be part of, I can learn from you and others can as well. And, um, and I'm just grateful to be part of an organization that does this stuff. Um, so again, thank you all for being with us. Um, Andrea, Bobby, thank you. Um, Please join us next, uh, actually July, we're not having a session because uh, we're taking a July as, a, as a, um, a break for some of our content creation. So we'll be back in August and I hope you'll be with us then. So until then, stay safe and be well. Thanks everyone. Thank you.